And we have lost sight that God is the sovereign Lord of all who does all things according to the counsel of his will. We have been in a war and we have been losing it and we're still losing it. But God is not male or female. God is spirit. God's not 51% male and 49% female. I'm talking about people that profess to be followers of Jesus Christ and who say they believe this book. The God of many modern Christians today is a God who is there to serve them and a God who is there to smooth out the bumps in life. Because we've lost the notion of our Father God. Because that's the God who reveals himself in the scriptures. If you haven't read it, I still, as of today, August 22nd, 2015, recommend you read the book. They speak of God, they speak of the Holy Spirit as it, so they can all feel better about relating to God. It has been, and this has never happened before or since, for 49 consecutive weeks, it was the number one bestseller in the New York Times bestseller list. We just found out recently, this week, Tim McGraw is going to be starring in a movie version of the famous book, The Shack. Yeah. Release bait, to be determined. Uh, I, actually, I'll leave here tonight and head straight out there and, and continue filming. Yeah, we started filming a couple of weeks ago. But anybody oh, that's read the book knows that it's a fantastic book. and Yeah. It's uh, very heavy and life-changing. You know. The Shack is in the top 40 bestsellers of all history. Of all history. That's how nuts this is. The Shack. It has become a phenomenon, topping the New York Times bestseller list for 27 weeks in a row. Well, I loved it. It's an awesome book. Thank you so much for writing it and uh, just want people to get a hold of it and enjoy it as well. Thank you so much, wow. Paul. 11,000 copies sold in four months from a garage. Well, not only that, through that garage we shipped 1.2 million in 13 months with less than $300 in marketing and advertising. So it was a phenomenon that was grassroots from the very get-go. Having sold millions of copies, the shack has become a publishing phenomenon. The Shack was published in 2007 and has gone on to become a New York Times bestseller. The Shack was authored by Canadian author William Paul Young. Originally not intended for publication, people close to Young encouraged him and helped in the novel's publication. This book is extraordinary. It was originally written, William Paul Young's wife asked him to write a book for their six children to explain a little bit about what had happened in his life. She expected it to be between four and six pages long. He produced this in a ring folder, 15 copies for family and friends. Family and friends thought, I want my friends to see this. And so they started photocopying it. Eventually, in 13 months, they sold from a garage over a million copies. Wayne Jacobson and Brad Cummings are the publishing company, Windblown Media. and it They was, did this just to help you well, do they, this. Exactly. And, and they did it to, because 26 publishers turned us down. Paul Young didn't consider himself a writer, but he wrote a story for his kids that has turned out to be a quick-selling phenomenon known as The Shack. In it, Paul shares a fictional story of a man whose daughter died under tragic circumstances and of how his world was changed forever during his greatest moment of sadness. The Shack is filled with lessons about tragedy and triumph, and it will challenge the way you view life. The story centers around a man by the name of Mackenzie Allen Phillips, called Mac by his friends and family. In the course of the book, Mac, a father of five, loses his daughter tragically during a camping trip. His daughter Missy has been abducted and murdered by a serial killer, and all the police find is a bloody dress in a shack in the woods. The shack represents for Mac the place of his deepest pain, also called 
the great sadness in the novel. You very much are Mac, the main character. Yeah, very much. The weekend Mackenzie spends. You have to remember always, I'm writing this for my children. This is trying to wrap my experience, my history into a story. And the weekend Mackenzie spends in the shack, which is the focus center of his loss, his pain, and uh, is, it represents 11 years of my life in, in trying, to, trying to deal with, you know, the, I use the shack as a metaphor. Um, it's the inside house of the soul. It's the broken heart. Shack defender Randall Rouser stated in his book, Finding God in the Shack, Young has made it clear that the book is fictional, albeit with a significant portion of autobiography thrown in. This fictional book looks at how Mac through an encounter with the three persons of the Trinity, at the shack finds healing. The book has been declared by many as a wonderful help for those dealing with pain in their lives. Others, however, have stated that the shack teaches theological heresy about the Trinity and other matters. The author William Paul Young stated that, criticisms have come almost exclusively from religious folk of course, there are those who have taken a position without having read the book for themselves, thereby discounting their right even to pretend an opinion. But there are others who truly feel the weight of responsibility to protect the flock of the faithful and to defend God against the intrusion of heresy or seductive doctrines. We are grateful for these brothers and sisters who are part of the family conversation and we have carefully considered their responses. And uh, I have emails from people whose lives have been transformed. Others uh, who have some theological beefs with quotes and page numbers from the shack. Randall Rouser, a supporter and defender of the book, commented, Within Christianity, there are few words that cut to the quick as sharply as heresy and the shack has certainly been charged with his share of heresies. I just happened to mention one time, or a couple of times, that I had read a book that, uh, while I was in prison for nine years over the dumbest law in the history of America, structuring, I read a book called The Shack, which was a novel. It's a story. It's made up, okay? It's a novel. But very interesting and very life-changing. So... <clears throat> And so somebody, every, hundreds of people have written me saying, thank you for recommending that book. I read it and I loved it and it changed my life. Hundreds of people. But several have said, oh, you're a hoven, you're, I'm hoven, you're a heretic for even recommending that book. That book's heresy. So in this novel, he, he, wanted, you know, he spends the weekend with God. God, why did you let this happen? If you haven't read it, I still, as of today, August 22nd, 2015, recommend you read the book. And that's going to anger some of these guys who wrote me letters. Well, listen, if you don't think people should read it, then you certainly shouldn't read it, and don't do it. Man, if you don't if you think it's bad, stay away. Who is right, the critics or the defenders of the book? Does the shack have a theology, or are we reading too much into it? In a foreword to the book, The Shack Revisited, by C. Baxter Kruger, William Paul Young, the author of The Shack, stated that The Shack was never intended to be a systematic theology or another book of pragmatic proof texts useful for badgering unwitting unbelievers into religious submission. It is fiction and it is story. It seems to be clear that the book is fiction. But does this mean that there is no theology being taught? William Paul Young states on the same page of this foreword, Please don't misunderstand me. The shack is theology, but it is a theology wrapped in a story, the word becoming flesh, living inside the blood and bones of common human experience. So you weren't setting out to write a theological treatise on the nature of God. You were writing about something deeper. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if there's much deeper than a theological treatise. But, <laughs> but uh, um, my intent was, was not 
to be trying to say, okay, this is Theology 101, systematic theology. It's, it's not that. And, uh, um, but the book is highly theological. There's, but life is theological. If God is involved in all the details of our lives, then life is theological. It is clear from Jung's own words that the shack is theology. But what theology? Well, God's used you to uh, shatter the preconceptions that a lot of us have about God. I think everybody's got, got some. We seem to like to put him in a box and to be able to evaluate what he wants so easily. You know, I'm, this, is, this is a work of fiction. This is a novel. Your this mom was not... a little distressed, though. Oh, when yeah. She, first... she, she closed the book, called my sister, and said, your brother's a heretic, you know. <laughs> but she got past that. It's a great story. But, um, um, and she's, very, she's comfortable with it now. Does it matter that it is fiction? Does it make any error it teaches okay? Fan of the novel and theologian Randall Rouser stated in his book, Finding God in the Shack. Can you get theology out of a novel? It seems that you can. Indeed, our conversations over seven chapters have demonstrated that the shack is brimming with fascinating theological questions and concepts. Arising from the Reformation of the 16th century, there was a battle cry that rallied the reformers and those who were a part of the Reformation. And that rally cry was sola scriptura. It was a trumpet blast that was a call to arms, really, to the believers of that day who were committed to the things of God. Uh, sola scriptura is Latin for scripture alone. For me, the, the issue of Sola Scriptura is probably the single most important doctrine uh, in many ways in, in the Christian Church. Um, but I see the, the doctrine of Sola Scriptura is that the Bible is all we need. It's theological jargon to point to a book and say, that book is the Word of God. It's quite another thing for the deepest recesses of your heart and life to be under its power. That's your conscience. Luther's confession was, my conscience is held captive by the word of God. So the great cry then of the Reformation in its practical outworking was sola scriptura. And Luther's great and monumental work was to get the scriptures into the language of the common people of Germany and most revolutionary of all, they discovered that the Bible teaches the doctrine that they called the formal principle of the Protestant Reformation. That is the principle that formed every other position adopted in the Reformation. They called it Sola Scriptura. Since the Reformation, the Christian Church has come to summarize what are the core essential beliefs of biblical Christianity. One of the foundations of the Reformation, one of the greatest revivals the world has ever seen, was Sola Scriptura. The doctrine of Sola Scriptura teaches that the Scriptures alone are the ultimate authority and not the imaginations of men. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 to 17 reads, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We see from this verse that all that is needed to live the Christian life are the scriptures. It is God breathed. The scriptures are sufficient for every good work. To seek to know God outside of these scriptures is unbelief. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 reads, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son whom he hath appointed heir of all things, 
by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Here we are told, while in times past God spoke to men in various ways, in these last days God has already spoken by His Son, the Word of God. The Bible states that we have this more sure Word of God, which is more sure than God's own audible voice from heaven. Second Peter chapter 1 verses 16 to 21 reads, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, and this voice which came from heaven we heard, when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We are also told in the Bible that Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 to 16 reads the following, And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture, and on his thigh, a name written, King of kings, and Lord of lords. Does the shack defend or attack this biblical doctrine? In the novel, the main character, Mac, receives a note from God, or as he calls him, Papa. The note reads as follows. Mackenzie, it's been a while. I've missed you. I'll be at the shack next weekend if you want to get together. Papa. Papa was a name used for God in the book, and it was originally used by Nan, Mac's wife. Mackenzie, the main character, um, lives in Oregon, where I'm living now, and uh, and you know Mackenzie's me, and uh, so it's. He has children, they go camping, they have a huge loss, he experiences a huge loss that centers around a shack way out in the wilderness uh, in Oregon. And uh, four years later he gets invited through a mysterious note that is written in such a way that it could be from the perpetrator, it could be from uh, just a bad joke, or actually it could even be from God inviting him back to the place of his pain, the shack. This book, while fiction, represents God in a certain light. The book represents a God that is still giving divine revelation. This would deny the sufficiency of scripture and place it outside of historic and theologically orthodox Christianity. Mack recalls later in the book of his seminary background when he said, In seminary, he had been taught that God had completely stopped any overt communication with moderns preferring to have them only listen to and follow sacred scripture, properly interpreted, of course. 
God's voice had been reduced to paper, and even that paper had to be moderated and deciphered by the proper authorities and intellects. Nobody wanted God in a box, just in a book. Hear the idea that God has spoken in his written word and that we are to trust this alone is to reduce his word somehow. This is a classic attack on Sola Scriptura and represents a belief that God is still revealing special revelation to man. It is a road to confusion. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. Once you can add something to the Bible, well, then you can bring any doctrine out of it. So we have Mormons who claim that they had a new revelation back in 1830 through Joseph Smith, and all the false doctrines come out of that. So that's why I would say the doctrine of Sola Scriptura is the single most important doctrine, because all the other doctrines rely on that, on that truth. The book teaches clearly from the beginning that God is communicating with man outside of the Word of God. The note that leads Mac to the shack demonstrates this and by the fact that the book places words and false theology in the mouth of God. The novel also attacks the objective truth of the Bible. If the Papa of the shack represents truth, metaphorically or otherwise, then the Bible cannot be trusted. God the Father, or Papa in the book, is blasphemously represented as a large, black, African woman, who stated the following, Mackenzie, I am neither male nor female, even though both genders are derived from my nature. If I chose, to appear to you as man or a woman, it's because I love you. For me to appear to you as a woman and suggest that you call me Papa is simply to mix metaphors to help you keep from falling so easily into your religious conditioning. Throughout the scriptures, God is called God, not Goddess. Father, not Mother. He, not she. Him, not her. And scripture calls Christ son, not daughter. Lord of lords, not lady of ladies. Bridegroom and husband, not bride or wife. Prophet, not prophetess. High priest, not priestess. King of kings, never queen of queens. Never. God revealed himself as male, nor does God ever represent himself as female anywhere in the Bible. To falsely represent God in this blasphemous way other than how he has chosen to reveal himself, is to violate the second and third commandments. When preaching on Mars Hill, Paul described God this way. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth life and breath and all things. He giveth to all life and breath and all things. This truth that God has revealed himself as male, along with all the other members of the triune God, is also attacked by C. Baxter Kruger's companion work, The Shack Revisited. Sometimes Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit using the pronoun he. While the Greek word for spirit, pneuma, is neuter, and the Hebrew word ruach 
wind or spirit is feminine. And you know, a black woman. Exactly. And imagery is always going to be inadequate because God is not male or female. And uh, you know, I'm, this, is, this is a work of fiction. This is a novel. We are never to use our imagination or anything else to form a similitude or likeness of any of the members of the Trinity. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 12 to 16 reads the following. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only ye heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go over to possess it. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb, out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female. Richard Bennett, a former Roman Catholic priest, comments, In the Lord's infinite wisdom, his manifestation of himself excluded everything that could be represented pictorially. Because the holy God is totally other and separate from his creation, to picture a created man and to label that picture with the name of the creator is to confuse the creator with the creation. Pictures and images produce a subjective impression in the one who sees them. Any image of Christ confuses and obscures the distinction between God and his created world. Thus, they are deceptions. Nicholas Ridley, a 16th century reformer, rightly observed, images in a church either serve to edify or to destroy. If they edify, then is there an edification which the scriptures neither teach nor command, but always disallow? If they destroy, they are not to be used, for in the church of God, all things ought to be done to edify. Early church father Athanasius stated, The invention of images came of no good, but of evil, and whatsoever hath an evil beginning can never in anything be judged good, seeing it is wholly naught. The second commandment as quoted in Exodus chapter 20 verses 4 to 6 reads the following Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. When writing about the second commandment, Thomas Watson stated, To set up an image to represent God is debasing him. This command was violated in the book as the Holy Spirit was represented as an Asian woman, Sarayu, and there was the use of William Paul Young's imagination of his image of Jesus. We are to trust the word of God alone in how we worship and represent God. Anything else makes little of God, which is irreverent and blasphemous. Image worshippers usually deny that they worship the image itself, but often maintain that it is only to aid in their worship of God. Such an example can be seen in the Roman Catholic Church's Catechism which quotes Thomas Aquinas as saying, Religious worship is not directed to images in themselves, considered as mere things. The movement towards the image does not terminate in it as an image, but tends towards that whose image it is. That was also the case in Israel, when the people called for Aaron to make an idol to represent the God that delivered them out of Egypt. They of course realized that the golden calf, which was just created from gold, had not been the entity 
which delivered them from the land of Egypt. The golden calf was to represent God, as much as the images used in the shack are. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. Exodus chapter 32 verse 1 As John Gill observed about Exodus 32 and the making of the golden calf, not that they were so very stupid to think that anything that could be made with hands was really God, or even could have life and breath, and the power of self-motion, or of walking before them, but that something should be made as a symbol and representation of the divine being carried before them. Thomas Watson also rightly observed, to worship God by an image, God takes as done to the image itself. Exodus 32 verses 7 to 10 states, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. E.S. Williams stated that, Roman Catholicism has always promoted the use of images, icons, pictures, and other works of art in the worship of God. The Reformed faith, in obedience to the second commandment, removed images, icons, and works of art from the church in order to focus on preaching, teaching, and understanding the Word of God. Was the Father crucified? Hello. Have a problem here. Was the Father crucified? The Son is crucified. The Father is in the Son. Was the Father crucified? Sure. The Father was crucified. Well, think about it. If the Father is in the Son and the Son is crucified, is is the Father abandoned from the Son? Is he separate from the Son? Is yes, he is. He's not the same person as the Son. One of the greatest documents written to represent the Orthodox Christian doctrine of the Trinity was the Athanasian Creed. Part of the Creed states the following. We worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Spirit. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is all one. The glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Nicene Creed, another early church creed, which states the Trinitarian doctrine, which all theologically orthodox Christian churches hold to, states the following. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father, before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men, for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead, 
whose kingdom shall have no end. While the shack accurately represents the fact that there are three persons in the Godhead in one way, the book, however, gives way to an ancient heresy known as modalism in other ways. The Athanasian Creed, the Nicene Creed, and other theologically orthodox creeds throughout history have all maintained that while the members of the Godhead are one in essence, they are all different in subsistence. This means the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son. Shack apologist Randall Rouser maintained that modalism has been condemned as heretical by the church when he stated, Imagine that the pastor of a typical Baptist church became convinced that the Trinity was false. Instead of believing that God is three persons, he came to believe that God is one person who plays three roles. Sometimes he acts as the Father. Other times he acts as the Son, and yet other times he acts as the Holy Spirit. This view is called modalism, and it has been considered a heresy by the Christian Church since the third century. The novel may appear to promote the idea of the Trinity, however, the book in fact leans heavily in the direction of modalism. Only Christ was crucified, but the book represents the Father as also being crucified. In the book on page 95 we find, Papa didn't answer, only looked down at their hands, his gaze followed hers, and for the first time Mac noticed the scars in her wrists. Like those, he now assumed Jesus also had in his. She allowed him to tenderly touch the scars, outlines of a deep piercing. The shack's papa then stated, Don't ever think that what my son chose to do didn't cost us dearly. Love always leaves a significant mark, she stated softly and gently. We were there together. When speaking on the Trinity, the Shack's Papa stated that all three members of the Trinity became incarnate. When we three spoke herself into existence as the Son of God, we became fully human. On the era of modalism, Mark Jones and Joel Beakey stated in their Puritan theology that early anti-Trinitarians argued that if Christ is God of the same substance with the Father, and the Father was incarnate too. The only member of the Godhead who became incarnate was Jesus Christ, not the Father or the Holy Spirit. Central to the Gospel of Jesus Christ is the fact that sin, all sin, must be punished. Either Christ prayed for a person's sin, or they will. When the Father poured out his wrath on the Son, who bore the sin of his people, it satisfied justice. Is this what the Shack believes? Or does it represent another gospel entirely? Isaiah 53 verses 10 to 12 Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he had poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Paul Washer in his book, The Gospel's Power and Message, stated, 
the Son of God, interposed himself between divine justice and his people. He drank down the wrath that we ourselves had kindled and the punishment we deserved. When he died, not one drop of the former deluge remained. He drank it all on our behalf. Romans 6.23 states, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 states, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Undermining the idea of the fact that the law demands perfect obedience, which has been fulfilled in Christ on the behalf of believers in Him. The Shaq's Papa states, Our relationship is not about performance, or you having to please me. I'm not a bully, not some self-centered demanding little deity insisting on my own way. While there is a certain truth here, that God's love cannot be earned as our greatest deeds are but filthy rags. However, it is not true to say that God does not demand perfect personal obedience. Exodus 23 verse 21 states, Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Believers are clothed in the perfect righteousness of Christ. And when God looks upon a believing Christian, he sees Christ's perfect fulfillment of the law of God. The demands of perfect obedience are met in Christ. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all that believe. Romans chapter 3 verse 22 The shack, sadly, is guilty here of twisting the doctrine of grace, God's unmerited favor, and turning it into lawlessness. Jude 1 4 states, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The novel denies that sin needs to be punished when Papa states, I don't need to punish people for sin. Sin is its own punishment, devouring you from the inside. It's not my purpose to punish it, it's my joy to cure it. While there is spiritual healing in the gospel, God is just and he will not change his attributes for anyone. He is God and he cannot change. God must punish and does punish sin. Paul Washer states, When man sins against God, he betrays the one who is worthy of his greatest allegiance, loyalty, commitment, and duty. For this reason, sin is the worst of treacheries, the highest form of treason, and evokes the penalty of death. The novel also has another definition for sin. According to the book, man fell because he wanted to assert his own independence, which is true in one aspect, but the book divorces this concept from disobedience. The Shacks Jesus stated, the world is broken because in Eden you abandoned relationship with us to assert your own independence. Mankind fell because Adam disobeyed God. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Romans 5, 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 states, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. The novel doesn't believe in obedience, so sin becomes breaking relationship 
and not a violation of the law. This is another way the shack represents or presents another gospel. Being healed according to the shack is a type of theistic therapy that delivers them from the great sadness, essentially being happy to just be yourself. Being saved in the shack is to be saved from sadness or depression. The Jesus of the shack claims that, as of the crowning glory of creation, you are made in our image, unencumbered by structure and free to simply be in a relationship with me and one another. If you had truly learned to regard each other's concerns as significant as your own, there would be no need for hierarchy. The theology of the shack clearly rejects hierarchy and therefore the necessity of obedience. The shack's Holy Spirit, or Sarayu, stated that, You humans are so lost and damaged that to you it is almost incomprehensible that relationship could exist apart from hierarchy. In another part, the shack's Jesus stated that, Once you have a hierarchy, you need rules to protect and administer it. And then you need law and the enforcement of the rules. And you end up with some kind of chain of command or a system of order that destroys relationship rather than promotes it. Later in the book, in a different exchange with Mac, the Shak Sarayu or Holy Spirit taught the following. The Bible doesn't teach you to follow rules. It is a picture of Jesus. So it is no surprise to see the doctrine of feminism, which rejects male headship in the home, emerging in the book. In an exchange with Mac, the Shacks Jesus stated, women in general will find it difficult to turn from a man and stop demanding that he meets their needs, provides security, and protects their identity and return to me. While there is an element of truth in here, as a woman can make a man more important than Christ, it is not one or the other if the man is her husband. Married women can and do serve God by submitting to their husbands. As long as the commands do not contradict any clear commands in God's law, then a married woman is commanded to obey God and her husband. The Shacks Jesus also stated, the world in many ways would be a much calmer and gentler place if women ruled. This would mean that the Bible's command for wives to submit to their husbands is harmful to families and that they would be better with female leadership. Later the Shacks Jesus reiterates the book's liberal, anti-biblical view on the role of women when he said to Mac, Power in the hands of independent humans, be they men or women, does corrupt. Mac, don't you see how filling roles is the opposite of relationship? We want male and female to be counterparts, face-to-face -face equals, each unique and different, distinctive in gender but complementary, and each empowered uniquely by Sarayu, from whom all true power and authority originates. Remember, I am not about performance and fitting into man-made structures. I am about being. As you grow in relationship with me, what you do will simply reflect who you really are. So the shack sees the command of wives submit to your husbands in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22 as man-made. Before we are told by defenders of the novel that the book is fiction, we should remind ourselves of William Paul Young's own words on the subject. The shack is theology. So you weren't setting out to write a theological treatise on the nature of God. You were writing about something deeper. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I don't know if there's much deeper than a theological treatise, but, <laughs> but uh, um, my intent was was not to be trying to say, okay, this is theology 101, systematic theology. It's it's not that. And uh, um, but the book is highly theological. There's but uh, life is theological. If God is involved in all the details of our lives, then life is theological. The dangers in regard to the shack and its heresies are emphasized by this alarming quote by Randall Rouser, who defends the book. Is it ever appropriate to think of God as mother or to pray, our mother who art in heaven? The shack offers us no settled position on this question. Uh, on page 225, we're told by God, quote, In Jesus I have forgiven all humans for their sins against me, but only some choose relationship. So has okay. Jesus... That's ha from Second Corinthians chapter 5 and Timothy chapter 4. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, so you're saying for, Jesus for is... This is a statement that is worthy of full acceptance, right, Timothy? This is a true statement worthy of full acceptance. Jesus Christ is the Savior of all mankind, especially of believers. Is he the Savior of all mankind? Jesus says, I have forgiven all sins, but only some choose relationship. And that's right out of 2 Corinthians 5.19, where it says that Jesus Christ, you know, that, that God the Father was in Christ. That's the nail scars on Papa's wrist. God the Father was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. So, you know, as if you're the very words of God, plead, say, be reconciled to him. It's one thing that God has, he's done everything for the reconciliation from his side. But we have But to we're choose. lost. Yeah, we're lost in our, our darkness and our blindness. Um, we've been included into that purpose of God since before the foundation of the world, all of us. But we are lost. And, and you know, the story of the prodigal sons, the beauty is that neither of those two boys, the religious kid, which was me, or the other one, which is actually my brother, would fit into that category. Brother who wandered. Yeah. And, but the beauty is that both of us were always sons. We were always sons. And so that wasn't the issue. The issue is that neither of us understood the love of the Father. Not really. And so the invitation is into this relationship that has been established in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is what 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. All died. Who's the all who died? The all who died can only be those who are in Christ. But he says he died for all. I can go to another verse to show you the same thing in the book of Romans, chapter 5, where it says justification results to all men. This is why you, you need extra you 10 minutes. You have to also acknowledge that there is a whole realm of theology that would say that, that everyone was wrapped up into Christ. Yeah, universalism uh, is a heresy. Brothers. No, no, it's not universalism. This is the Torrance brothers. This is good, solid, orthodox theologians. Before we look at the gospel as presented by the shack, let us look at the true biblical gospel of grace. Christ, the prophets of the Old Testament, and the apostles all called on men to repent and believe. Repentance and faith are two sides of the one coin. Without repentance, you cannot have saving faith, but feeling sorry alone will not save. It is when someone is regenerated and made a new creature in Christ. Man is clearly commanded to repent and believe the gospel. Matthew chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 states, in those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 15 states, now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. The apostle Peter preached this 
as part of his message to the people of Israel at the temple. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 states, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The Westminster Larger Catechism, question 76, states the following, Repentance unto life is a saving grace, wrought in the heart of a sinner by the Spirit and Word of God, whereby out of the sight and sense not only of the danger but also of the filthiness and odiousness of his sins and upon the apprehension of God's mercy in Christ to such as are penitent he so grieves for and hates his sins as that he turns from them all to God purposing and endeavoring constantly to walk with him in all the ways of new obedience However, the shack ignores the need for repentance and makes it clear that it represents it as not being necessary for reconciliation to God. In an exchange between Mac and the personification of Papa's wisdom, Sophia, we hear the following words said to Mac. You are a glorious destructive mess, Mackenzie, but you are not here to repent at least not in the way you understand. Later, after the exchange, when Mac is told by the shack's papa, after he said he was sorry for what he had done, but that is past now, where it belongs. I don't even want your sorrow for it, Mac. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. While the joy of the Lord is to be our strength, we must repent, which is a heartfelt sorrow over our sin and fleeing from it. Then and only then will we be what the Bible calls blessed in the Lord. We cannot serve our sin and God at the same time. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 states, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. The Lord does not call us to constant sorrow, but joy in him, but we are to turn from and hate our sin. We are sinners, and we ought to be of a broken spirit for what we have done. The Lord is nigh unto those people who hate their sin. This concept is foreign to the spirit of the shack. So no repentance is required for reconciliation. But what does the book teach by way of a gospel? Is it the true biblical gospel where all who come to Christ are forgiven of their sins and clothed in Christ's perfect righteousness? Or is it something else? Unfortunately for William Paul Young and the millions of readers of The Shack who agree with the book, it is something else. The Apostle Paul condemns the preaching of any other gospel. He stated, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ 
unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Papa in the shack explains this other gospel to Mac when he stated, Honey, you asked me what Jesus accomplished on the cross? So now listen to me carefully. Through his death and resurrection, I am now fully reconciled to the world. Mac responds by saying, The whole world? You mean those who believe in you, right? Papa replied, The whole world, Mac. Papa says that reconciliation is a two-way street, but at best the teaching here is ambiguous. This quote definitely suggests the teaching of universalism, that all men will be or are saved. Later in another part of the novel, Papa says, when talking about Missy's killer, you don't have a relationship with this man, at least not yet. Forgiveness does not establish relationship. In Jesus I have forgiven all humans their sins against me. But only some choose relationship. Mackenzie, don't you see that forgiveness is an incredible power? A power you share with us. A power Jesus gives to all whom he indwells so that reconciliation can grow? When Jesus forgave those who nailed him to the cross, they were no longer in his debt. While for some, these and other statements may not convince someone that the shack teaches universalism, but consider the following information from a book written by C. Baxter Kruger. Kruger's book, called The Shack Revisited, includes the endorsement of William Paul Young himself, who said the following on the book's cover. If you want to understand better the perspectives and theology that frame the shack, this book is for you. So what does this book say about the shack and especially the fate of Missy's killer? Missy's murderer is not going to skip through the pearly gates playing with ladybugs. To begin with, heaven is where the Blessed Trinity dwells. And the evil that is hijacked and so horribly twists and misuses this man avoids the light at all costs. While the murderer is forgiven, loved and accepted, while he is embraced and included, he does not know it by any stretch of the imagination, and such unknowing leaves him breathing in pain and trapped in the clutches of darkness. He belongs to the Father, Son and Spirit. Always has, always will, but he has given himself to participate in darkness. He acts out of the lie of the evil one and its grotesque meaninglessness, wreaking havoc in the lives of all around. He has become a terrible monster, living an alien form of existence in violation of the true self in Christ. And this alien existence must be transformed in the fire of Jesus' love. Later in the same book about the shack, Kruger writes, the hope of the human race is that we belong to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We always have and always will. So what is your view on hell? I'm a father. I have six children. Uh, I have four boys and two girls, age 19 to 32. If my daughter believes a lie about her value, or say I have a son who becomes a methamphetamine addict, I'm a father. And because of my love for them, I would, I would like to be a consuming fire that goes into the middle of that lie that she believes, or in the middle of that addiction that he is stuck inside of, and I would like to burn it out of their existence. But how do you do that without their participation? Because love for me is fundamentally relational. And if you don't have freedom, you don't have free love. 
So let's move to reconciling then with God. Someone does say, I need to know how I'm going to face my day of crisis. Hell then becomes potentially restorative, right? The fire becomes restorative. And this is why the words like kalesis are used that are in the Greek that are pruning words and, and words of transformational change. It's that way when it refers to those whose wood, hay, and stubble, the choices that they've made are, turns out to be useless stuff, right? It gets burned up too, right? So there is a sense of this restoration, which is part of reconciliation. I am her father. Give me the ability to be a flaming fire and go in and eradicate that little piece of tissue that has hurt my daughter. And even more so, to destroy the lie that hurt my daughter, I would do so in a heartbeat. Not because she has, what, failed to live up to my expectations? No, because I love my daughter. That is the relentless affection of God. God does not desire is simply to cure sin and brokenness. His intent is to destroy it. I believe in a God of fire and fury, just so you know. But I believe that that fire and fury is one way to look at this relentless affection and love that is pursuing everything in us that keeps us from being free. I believe that 100% of this fury is for us, not against us. And I'm talking about every human being on the planet, right? I'm saying Jesus Christ is okay. the Savior of all mankind. Is so a is, is a person in hell forgiven of his sins? Oh, so you think people are already in hell? Do you believe that? If when he died, it all died, and when he rose, it all rose. Like all. If that, if, if his... Uh, incarnation, death, resurrection, and ascension included the entire cosmos, the universal cosmos, I'm a universalist. If that's your definition, uh, if by universalism, do I, am I committed to a doctrine that says, and this is the one that people tend to go after, am I committed to a doctrine that says that everybody ultimately will be completely and fully reconciled back to relationship with uh, with God, and uh, if if universalism is defined that way as a doctrine, then I'm not. I am not that because I don't think that it's stated anywhere in a doctrinal kind of way. I think it's left in a quite an ambiguous sense, which drives you back away from trusting doctrine to trusting person. And the question is: Is this the character of someone that you can trust? So. I, I hope, I hope in a, in, a, in a very strong sense, and I pray for the reconciliation of all things fully and completely back. I hope that's right. The problem is, in this apparent rejection of universalism, you have to understand what William Paul Young means by reconciliation. This does not include the atonement. What I mean by that is, and if you read the companion work, see Baxter Kruger's work on this as well, which William Paul Young endorses, and states, if you want to understand the shack better, you need to read this book. He also reiterates that everybody, regardless of whether they're reconciled or not, their sins have been paid for. Now, in repeated interviews, William Paul Young does not answer the question. He avoids it, but he does say, and it's quite clear, he is a universalist. He believes that all sins have been paid for but that does not mean all are in relationship with the Father. Did he for cancel, all mankind? Did he cancel it out for everybody who ever lived? Awesome. So then why would anybody go to hell if the certificate of debt is canceled? Because human beings, we, do, we deserve the respect that allows us to say no to relationship forever. They take them all. So, yeah. so it's not the issue that what Father, Son, and Holy Spirit accomplished did not actually accomplish it. The issue is whether we want to participate in the relationship that they accomplished or not. And human beings could say forever no to that relationship. And that would be hell. Sadly, he does not believe in the hell of the Bible. What does he believe? He believes that hell is restorative. And he keeps using these terms over and over, pruning, purging. 
when you know something about Paul Young's background, and as you said in the introduction, I've known him for over a dozen years, uh, this is somewhat typical of uh, the author. Uh, he likes to uh, think outside the box. He's a very intelligent and sharp individual, very likable person. He presented a, a document to a think tank that he and I incidentally co-founded, and we found great delight in sharing theological stuff with a group of other people, and we talked about uh, all kinds of issues, and, and one day Paul presented a paper uh, in which he said clearly he was rejecting his evangelical paradigm and embracing universal reconciliation, mm. uh, universal salvation. I uh, responded to his paper point by point and argued that uh, he was wrong biblically, uh, logically and historically. Uh, as a result of that, I guess Paul stopped coming to our group, abandoned us, I, I sense that anyway, and uh, that happened in 2004. Jesus Christ is the Savior of all mankind. Did Jesus forgive everybody of all of their sins, even those who have died without Christ, in rebellion to Christ, and are going to face that judgment as a goat and be uh, eternally damned? Are their sins forgiven? For Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men. Okay, so you can't answer the question. See, if you do, you know you're stuck. So what is the gospel according to the shack? We don't have to follow any rules, as there are no rules. All we have to do is embrace who we are, and apparently, what we always have been. This is a form of universalism, where those who are in relationship know that they are saved, but all men are loved, embraced and accepted in Christ. Jung and Kruger both believe all men have been redeemed regardless of faith or repentance. In this gospel there is no condemnation for unbelief or sin. Sin punishes us rather than God righteously punishing sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 2 to 4 reads, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. If you have played the fool thus far, and the stripes await you, flee from the rock to come. Have you been trusting? in the God of your own imagination, or the God of the shack? Are you in love with a book that blasphemes God and denies his word on almost every page? Do you truly know Christ? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Do you walk in a narrow way? Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Are you truly born again? Jesus said in John chapter 3 verse 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. A person who is a believer in Christ is a new creature, and he does not serve his old idols as he once did. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Flee from your idolatry. 
repent of your sins and crimes before a holy God and come to Christ, trusting in Him and in Him alone. Revelation chapter 21 verses 5 to 8 reads, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Never trust your heart and the imaginations of it. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 read, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not in thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 reads, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Be sure that you know the true gospel and the true God of the Bible or perish forever under the wrath of God. John chapter 3 verses 35 to 36 states, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. The evidence that you have come to know God is not simply religious activity or morality, but the realities of what we are finding in 1 John, if you are a Christian, will be realities in your own personal life. When I said at the beginning that the true Christian walks in the light, they live a style of life that reflects the character of God and conforms to the will of God. Is that a reality in your life? When I say that a true Christian is sensitive to sin, are you sensitive to sin? And does the Holy Spirit lead you to, to pronounce that sin before Him? If you think your sins are so wonderful, if you think your sins are to be clung to and Christ rejected, know this for sure, that you have heard the one message the one gospel in which there is deliverance, the truth of God. Are your sins so wonderful that they're worth going to hell for? Because they'll surely take you there unless you turn from them to this Saviour, Jesus Christ.